Hello everyone, this is Jean-Michel for the OSIA team. In this video, we are going to see how to use OSIA with processing. First, we'll see how to use the LibOSIA Java API from within processing, and then we'll see how to control our processing patches with OSIA score. To do that, we'll first need to install processing and OSIA score. First, we have to go to the processing website or if you are using Linux into your package manager, processing.org, and download processing for your operating system. I am running this tutorial on Linux, but it will also work on Windows and Mac OS. So download it. And I already have it installed, so I can just run it from my computer. OK, processing free, this is what you should see. and. OK, that's it. Then we'll need OSIA score and LibOSIA. To download OSIA, go to osia.io. And first, go to LibOSIA, download, press the little processing logo, and you can download the latest version directly from here. All right, save it somewhere. And we are good to get started. We are going to go and check some example code which lives in GitHub in osia slash libosia to make our work. Go to src, osia java, and example processing. So this example has on top a small header which explains the most important steps of this tutorial. You have to download some stuff and extract it in your processing sketch folder. And then you can get started with doing stuff with OSIA Java and OSIA score with processing. So we'll just copy this code, which is extremely simple, just draws a rectangle in our processing patch. And I'll make the font a bit larger because it is absolutely unreadable. 24, 24, OK. OK, that should be much better. All right. So if you try to run this script like that, it won't work as it won't find the OSIA extensions. So we have to install it and extract, extract it somewhere. If you see um, this package IO does not exist, that is the issue. So to do that, we have to go and um, open the folder of our processing sketch and create a new subfolder, which is called code. Then inside this code folder, we'll have to extract um, the OSIA Java thing, which was uh, downloaded before. And it should, look, it should look like that. You should have a gna.jar and OSIA Java.jar file inside a code subdirectory inside your sketch folder. Let's save it. Um, sketchbook, OK. And um, hopefully it has. Oh, it was in a temporary directory, so <laughs> we must check. OK, it moved everything correctly. That's fine. Now, this should run. This runs, and this patch is extremely simple. I, I make it a bit bigger, 500 times 500, and uh, 400, 400, OK. All right. So um, this patch is extremely simple. Right now, it only displays a rectangle, a uh, colored rectangle. What we are going to do is um, check that this color comes from OSIA. And what OSIA allows to do is to um, declare the list of parameters of your processing patch, state what are their name, what, your, what is their unit. For instance, uh, it's unit in a very broad meaning like RGBA or HSV or HSL for color, or distance in pixels or in meters for, for distances, positions in Cartesian or uh, polar coordinates, that kind of thing. Default values, description, and basically everything to describe entirely what are the inputs of your processing patch. Note that it also works for Max MSP, for Pure Data, for Python, from C, Open Frameworks. We try to have a lot of bindings for OSIA. So to make sure that it works, once you have your processing sketch running, what you can do is um, go um, to uh, the local host address. 
on the port which is here. So five, six, seven, eight. And if it works, no, maybe not one, two, four, sorry. One, three, four. Okay, it doesn't work at all. Oh, no, that's because I, I said HTTPS and we don't want HTTPS, we want HTTP. Okay, so um, here I am using Firefox. Why? Because Firefox has this very nice feature where it pretty prints JSON. So uh, when you use OSIA in a processing patch, what happens is that it exposes a small WebSocket server over the port that you state here. And anyone can come and query this WebSocket server to say, hey, what are the parameters in this app? And um, if we see the raw JSON, it looks like that. But in pretty print mode, it looks like this. So we see that we have a parameter, which is called foo slash bar, uh, which is of type R. So this is based on OSC. So R is a color, RGBA color in OSC. So we get the hexa code of the color. Um, access mode is, is it an input or output? Doesn't matter for now. Clip mode doesn't matter. And a small description, which is what we put in here. Now, what happens is that um, other software, so OCR score, for instance, but also Vizier or MadMapper, Milamine, VDMX, um, are able to um, fetch this data and send it controls. So um, I'll first make a small example with score of control of this color, and then we'll go step by step um, through the um, Java API. So uh, let's download score in github slash OCR slash score from the OCR website. Uh, we can go here, score, download, and uh, here I'm on Linux. So I actually already have it. So I can just go inside my um, download folder um, and open it like this. So uh, on Linux, OCR score is distributed as an app image which means that you generally have to mark it as um, executable. And then you can just double click on it. It'll open. And this is the score user interface. So score will allow you to write scores that control in time the parameters that you declare in your processing patch. How does that work? Now uh, you see that big part, right click to add a device. So in OSIA parlance, a device is a kind of either hardware or software device. So processing from the point of view of OCR score is a device. And we can do right click, add device. And the protocol that we want here, so we have all the protocols available and understood by OCR score. The one we want is OSC query. And here we see that our processing patch is visible. So it is exposed over um, DNSSD. And um, we can just press Add here. So processing is the name that we set here in the processing patch. And now we see our parameter. It is available in real time. And we'll see what happens if we change the value here. For instance, let's put it at 50. And we see that um, the patch changes. So I'll just take a small picture right now because my cat is being extremely cute, and I share that somewhere. All right. Um, so as you can see, here you can control directly the values, and uh, let's say 150. And that's the first way to automate things. So now what we can do with score is, in a very simple way, create um, color gradients. So you can go at the bottom here. And inside processes, go to automation and select automation color. And for now, we, it will create an empty gradient. Uh, it, it, it won't send this gradient anywhere. Now, what you want to do is to, um, so there is a small issue with cursors. Here, you, you can click on the gray, green, little green thing. And um, by right clicking on the address here, you can select a big gradient address. And now, notice that if we play back with space, it will send the gradient in real time to our processing patch. So this can work both ways. The processing patch can also send data in real time in OCS Core. We'll see how to do that. Um, and if you want, in our case, it is gradient. You can just double click here, for instance, and add color points. And this will interpolate 
in LA star B star space to make it work. All right, so this is a very simple first overview of what is possible to do. Now let's delve a bit more into the Java API. So as you can see here, there are a lot of um, various controls, uh, various variables and types, protocol, AC query server, device, uh, node, parameters. So uh, we are going to go through all of this. Um, protocol is basically um, the kind of network protocol that OCI uses to, to communicate between two software. So at this time, the preferred protocol is OSI query, which is a common initiative between a lot of um, creative coding software. It was started by VDMX, and you can go check the spec by looking for OSI query inside uh, Google. So there is the introductory blog post and um, the specification. If you want to implement this protocol in your own software, it's all on GitHub and um, everything is well described. And so that is what we are using right now to exchange messages between OCEAN processing. So it's a combination of WebSocket for um, the, the big uh, JSON messages and uh, OSC for these fast um, data control messages. Then a device in OCI parlance is um, the root of a tree of nodes. Basically, uh, if you know OSC, you know that you have um, various OSC nodes, OSC parameters, OSC messages, which all have addresses. So a device is where it starts. And you can have multiple OSC devices in a single application. Um, they will all have to have different protocols uh, so that they use different ports, for instance. And that's it. Then we have parameters. And parameters are the things in the tree which actually contain some kind of value. For instance, a floating point number, integer, string, colors, that kind of thing. Then what we are going to do is in our setup part of processing, we are going to create all the parameters that we want to make um, public. And we want the outside world to be able to access, control, read, write to, that kind of thing. So uh, first, we select a node object, which is our root node. And um, then we will do this little dance of creating a child, giving it a name, setting it a type, assigning it a value, giving it a description, and blah, blah, blah. Um, the whole API is available in github.com slash osia slash libosia. And we can go to src, osia java, io.osia. And the most important thing here is um, builder. Where is it? Uh, Parator builder. So. Uh, these are all the functions that you, you can call on uh, this root.newchild function call. And you can set a lot of things. For instance, you can set a domain. So a domain is range. For instance, if you want to bound a floating point value between 10 and 100, that's what you will do. Let's do exactly that. Uh, parameter my uh, float. So we'll do the same thing, my float call root.newchild dot name uh, my float. Let's give it a very simple address dot type just let's say. So here in type, there are a lot of possibilities. So you can go and check in the extremely preliminary um, score documentation here. In features, there is um, addresses. And here you have the list of Currently, everything that is understood by OSIA. Uh, for instance, for floating points, you can set all these names and it will be kind of recognized as a float. You can also set a name of unit. For instance, if you have a distance, you can put in here a meter by, by, by second or that kind of thing. And it will be recognized as a unit and it will be available for other software to do intelligent thing with it, show specific UI controls. That kind of thing. So for now, we are just going to say that it is a floating point value. And we'll say, OK, you are between uh, minus 100 and 100, for instance. And and that's all. And description. We, 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 you don't have to put description. It's not necessary. 
But we can check a bit what are the other controls. So we have uh, name, type. So name and type are mandatory, else we don't know what to do with it. And if you don't put both name and type, it won't create the thing. Description is not mandatory. Domain is not mandatory. Unit uh, will most of the time be deduced by the type, but you can set it explicitly. Access mode and bounding mode. So bounding here is interesting. Bounding is uh, what do you want to do if, for instance, uh, I send an OSC message that goes above 100. Do you want to clip at 100? But uh, do you want to uh, wrap around at a minus 100? Do you want to fold back? So these are useful behaviors in creative coding if you have, say, a um, hardware control for which you don't quite control the input and output range. You can still have it do useful things when you go past the bounds. Critical means um, this parameter is important, and I definitely don't want it to get lost as a UDP message. So as you may know, OSC uses UDP, and UDP is not necessarily reliable. It's very fast, but you lose the guarantee that every message is arrived. So if you set it as critical, it will go for TCP instead, which is safer, which is quite important. For instance, if you want to send a play message at some point, then if you miss, if the UDP router drops the packet, uh, then your score won't start, which will be very sad. So, so often you want to do that. Repetition filter means do we want to send messages if it's already at the value that we're trying to send? Do, do we want a new message for every value, or do we just want the value changes, basically? Uh, and there are a lot of other um, useful uh, controls. But for now, we are just going to set a bounding mode at um, bounding mode dot, let's say, um, clip. And it will never go under 100 and always uh, never go below 100. No, well, it, it will clip between minus 100 and 100. And at the end, we want to materialize our parameter. And we just make get. Now, what can we do with that parameter? So in this case, what we're going to do is instead to uh, instead of um, using the parameter to draw something, well, for instance, we, we will always use it to, um, let's say, uh, uh, set um, our rectangle width um, and height. Uh, so it, maybe it should rather be between 100 and uh, 500. It will make more sense. And uh, here we are going to just read our value. So here, as you can see, in the draw method, we are reading the color. So we call our my color parameter, get value gets it in an abstract type kind of way. And then uh, we know that it is a color, so we can do uh, as vec4, which will be RGBA vector. And um, if it's not a vec, it's OK. It will try to convert as best as it can. For instance, if you have a floating point number, it will set a vec with all the components set to that floating point number, that kind of thing. So here, what I want to do is my float dot get value dot as float, for instance. So you could also have as int. And we'll just declare a small variable instead it will be cleaner and side and side okay let's restart it uh bonding mode uh, where that is uh, um, okay um okay i don't remember the syntax for that okay let's forget the clip all right so right now, oh, we didn't set value. So right now it's at zero. So let's say um, a default value of 200, for instance. All right, so now it has a 200 uh, side. And uh, note that um, from OCS score, we noticed that we, we lost the connection here. When it's in italic, it means that it's not connected. So we want to reconnect. And then we want to tell it, OK, look for uh, new things that may have been created, and now it will see the my float thing, and we'll see that it's at 200, and we can say okay 500, and we can see here in score what are the values parameters, so minus, max, that kind of thing, and now 
what we could want to do is an automation. So to make an automation, first I create a temporal interval. So to do that, uh, you can just uh, press C and your cursor will change with this little plus thing, which means I'm creating stuff. And now you are creating a time interval in which you can put various processes. That's what I did earlier with um, the, the gradient. And now you can drop things in it. So um, when you drop an automation like that, you will notice that the automation has uh, this dashed look. Um, it means that it is twinning. So twinning is a concept quite useful in OSIA score. It means that when the automation starts, um, instead of starting from zero, like how it looks here, it will start from um, the... Oh. Oh, it seems that there is a bug in the uh, minus and max. Let's see, where is the bug here? No, min max is 500, so there is a bug here in the minus and max parsing. OK, well, just another bug in the backlog. Um, so uh, yeah, twinning it says that um, when the automation starts, instead of um, starting at 0, it will go look what is the current value and perform a smooth swarm from it. And it's only for the duration of the dash. So if you add points, then the, the second point will be a normal automation. So here, what this means is that since it's 500, well, it will start at 500 and go from 500 to here, like that. All right. And now we see that thing is becoming bigger and bigger. And so you can um, create curves by pressing shift and holding shift. And uh, it will look like that. And, all right. So um, this is a very crude example of how you use um, OSIA to control automations. But um, another thing that we want to be able to do instead of doing that is um, to get input from the processing patch and output for to score. So a very crude way to do that is to use the mouse cursor position and send it to OSIA. So uh, if I remember correctly, we can just do something like my color dot push. No, not my color, my float dot push and it must be mouse x i think something like that all right uh, we'll restart it and um, mm -hmm. so here we need to reconnect fresh and okay now you can see that when i move the mouse here then it's changing in osia so the communication is both ways um, now, what, what kind of useful things can we do with that? Well, OSIA score has a lot of useful processes for mappings. So the most basic one is um, the uh, curve-like mapping. So let's add mapping here. And uh, this is a process with one input and one output. So let's take at input, as input our floating point number and as output, We'll send it to, uh, let's say, the red component. Uh, so it's between uh, 0 and 255. And it will perform the, the linear mapping or according to this curve, actually. And um, yeah, oh, just not pressing the right key. OK, like this, it will perform uh, this linear, non-linear transfer function between this input and this output by setting the appropriate um, range. So um, what I recommend when you do mappings is that uh, if you want it to run, you can just select the last dot right here and add a trigger on it. So it will show up in the inspector. The trigger means that it will run until it is interrupted by some kind of trigger, and if you don't press on it or send any OSC message to it, 
it will keep running forever. So this means that we have our mapping running. And now, notice that when I um, move my mouse, it is um, changing. So the three, the three components, so RGBA, because we are having a floating input. And what we can do is say, OK, I just want actually to control the red component like that. So you can add a dot R at the end here. Or another option is to go here, color um, RGB 8 and R and all right. And here, now we control the, um, do we? Uh, oh, it was set between 0 and 1. And we want between 0 and 255. All right. OK, so here we have uh, no red at all. And here we have maximum red. And, and that's it. Um, another fun, fun thing that can be done is um, controlling in another space. For instance, you can say, OK, I want to control this. Uh, I want to control the hue, for instance. And here you'll say, OK, uh, color and um, HSV and H here. And what happens is, um, so here you are saying, at this point, I am speaking in the HSV data space. And when it is time to, to go outside to processing, then it will be converted to, so it knows that uh, processing wants uh, RGBA uh, 8, which means numbers between 0 and 255. And at this point, it will convert in the correct format so that processing understands it. So you can have various um, color space conversions, but it works for every kind of unit in OCR. So let's try that now. And uh, OK, I'll set just a bit of a different color. OK. OK, and now it's much more funky. If I move my mouse, it is controlling the U of um, the thing. And you can have various kinds of feedbacks like that. Now, maybe I want to use the color to actually perform some other operation, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's uh, mostly it. And um, then the whole API is available uh, here. The most important things are these node and parameter things. So for instance, in parameter, you can see all the control messages that you can send to, um, to OCR. Uh, you can set various parameters on it. You can mute and unmute parameters, um, that kind of thing. So um, that's it. So if you have any question, please come and ask us on either forum.ocr.io or on the chat. So you can um, find both of those in the OCR.io website. So chat will open the score, web score chat. And there is also um, the uh, LibOCR chat, which is more for the API part of things. So uh, we can discuss here. We can help you. So feel free to come and ask us. And thanks for your time. This was Jean-Michel for us. Yeah.